let's move on to question number three part a figure 1.1 represents part of the wall of the proximal convoluted tubule or pct in a kidney nephron so guys as you can see in figure 1.1 this is a part of the proximal convoluted tubule showing the cells of uh, the proximal convoluted tubule and then there is a lumen of proximal convoluted tubule and a blood capillary runs along the PCT cells or the proximal convoluted tubule. Part 1. Name the features of the wall of the PCT that are labeled A and B in figure 1.1. So guys if you look at A so basically the A structures are the microvilli. As you all know that the proximal convoluted tubule cells have um, two types of membranes. This membrane, this type of membrane, which is facing the lumen of the PCT is known as the luminal membrane. And luminal membrane contains finger-like projections called microvilli. So guys, structure of feature A is microvilli. Then we have uh, the membrane which faces the blood capillary and this is called the basal membrane. Right. So A is the feature A is the microvilli and you can also write brush border. Microvilli are, al are also known as brush border. If you talk about B, so guys B is the tight junction. And what is the function of the tight junction? Guys, tight junctions are present where? Between the two PCT cells. And these tight junctions ensure that no molecule flows between the cells. As you all know that the PCT cells are involved in what? In the selective reabsorption. So guys, any molecule, for example, molecule A, if this has to be reabsorbed first this molecule a needs to enter into the pct cells and then this has to cross the pct cell and then goes into the blood this is called selective reabsorption right so as you all know that pct cells are involved in selective reabsorption and any molecule that has to be absorbed uh, must pass through the cell surface membrane or the luminal membrane and then it needs to cross the pct cell and then it has to go into the blood right so uh, tight junctions ensure that no molecule flows between the cells and molecules which have to be absorbed only pass or cross the cell first. This is because uh, the reabsorption is selective and to ensure the selectivity, the molecules must pass the PCT cells and they should flow through the cells and not between the cells so tight junctions ensure that no molecule passes between the cells part two on figure 1.1 use the letter c with a label line to show where co-transport of glucose with sodium ions occurs so guys as you all know that uh, the luminal membrane which has microvilli these microvilli contains what these microvilli contains sodium glucose co-transport proteins right and what these uh, co-transport proteins do these co-transport proteins uh, cause or we can say transport sodium ions by diffusion into the cell and together with sodium ions glucose molecules are pumped against the concentration gradient into the cell right so this is a sodium glucose co-transport protein and this transports sodium and glucose together so guys, uh, we will label C at which point? We will label C at this point because this is the point where this is the point where sodium and glucose are co-transported. All right. Let's uh, move on to the next part. Use the letter D with a label line to show where active transport of sodium ions occurs. So guys, as you all know that in the basal membrane, there are uh, sodium potassium pumps and these sodium potassium pumps are involved in the active transport of sodium ions and these are found in the basal membrane. So these uh, sodium potassium pumps, what they do is that they pump 
sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell and for every three sodium ions pumped out two potassium ions are pumped in so we will write d we will label d at this point because um, at this point the active transport of sodium ions occurs let's move on to part b table 1.1 shows the quantities per day of some of the substances that are removed from the blood by ultrafiltration reabsorbed into the blood by the proximal convoluted tubule and excreted in urine so guys this is the table which shows that the quantity uh, shows the quantity of substances which are uh, removed from the blood by ultrafiltration and uh, the percentage of the substances which were filtered uh, percentage absorbed or we can say um, percentage reabsorbed into the blood from pct uh, that means that what percent of the substance that is filtered is reabsorbed for example urea uh, the urea filtered is 56 grams and 46.4 percent of this value is reabsorbed and the remaining is excreted right all right so complete table 1.1 by calculating the quantity of sodium ions excreted in the urine write your answer in the table to one decimal place show your working in the space below so guys um what we have to do we have to calculate this value over here and this is the quantity excreted in the urine for the sodium ions and the units are arbitrary units so guys uh, basically this is the uh, concentration of uh, or quantity of sodium ions which were filtered by the Bowman's capsule into the uh, for example uh, what I mean is that uh, this is the quantity of sodium ions which were filtered at the Bowman's capsule uh, from the glomerulus and uh, this is the percentage of those ions which uh, were reabsorbed back into the blood so the remaining percentage is the quantity of uh, sodium ions which are excreted so for example if uh, 25,200 uh, arbitrary units of sodium ions are filtered and 99.4 percent of that is reabsorbed back into the blood so the remaining percentage is excreted in the urine so what we can do is that we can minus uh, 99.4 from 100 and that is um, 0 0.6 percent so 0 0.6 percent sodium flows into the urine 0 0.6 percent of what 0 0.6 percent of the filtered load right so what we can do is that we can find out the 0 0.6 percent of uh, uh, 20 uh, 5200 so how do we find this out 0 0.6 percent is what 0 0.6 divided by 100 into 25200 so let's uh, calculate the answer 0 0.6 divided by 100 into 25,200 so guys the answer is 151.2 and we have to write the answer in the table to one decimal place so the answer will be 151.2 all right part c a person who has type 1 diabetes mellitus cannot produce enough insulin this results in some glucose being excreted in the urine the urine can be tested for glucose using a dipstick. Name two enzymes present on the dipstick and outline the reaction catalyzed by each enzyme. So guys, if we recall dipstick, so the dipstick has how many enzymes? It has two enzymes. One is glucose oxidase and the other one is peroxidase, right? So how do these enzymes work? is that when we uh, put the dipstick into the urine sample there's a pad on the dipstick and that pad contains these enzymes right so if uh, glucose is there in the uh, urine it will be oxidized to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide right gluconic acid plus hydrogen peroxide so guys what is the purpose of glucose oxidase 
glucose oxidase oxidizes glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide so we will write over here that the reaction that glucose oxidase catalyzes is that we can say that it catalyzes the oxidation of glucose to gluconic acid to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide right what is the purpose of peroxidase then after hydrogen peroxide is formed what peroxidase does is that the peroxidase catalyzes the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and chromogen so guys you all know that chromogen is a compound which is present in the pad together with peroxidase and glucose oxidase right so uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, reacts with chromogen to form a colored compound and this reaction to form a colored compound and this reaction is catalyzed by peroxidase so we can write that peroxidase uh, sorry peroxidase catalyzes the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and chromogen to form a colored compound right and if the colored compound is produced that will change the color of the dipstick uh, pad and uh, the test will be positive the glucose will be present in the urine so we will write over here that peroxidase what it does is that it catalyzes the reaction between catalyzes the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and chromogen and chromogen to form a colored compound right so guys if uh, glucose is present in the urine these two reactions can take place eventually leading to the formation of the colored compound that will show the presence of uh, glucose in the urine and that will give the positive result if glucose is absent these two reactions will not occur and colored compound will not be produced and because of that the color of the pad will not change and the result will be negative so guys we are done with this question thank you so much for watching a laugh is everyone